Thank you, everybody. 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 Thank Let's start with questions. Anybody have anything they want to discuss or any concerns? Hearing none. Of course, of course, <laughs> of course you have concerns <laughs> whether or not you want to express it. So I would like to, um, on behalf of the Board of Selectmen and Town Administrator's Office, uh, again welcome you. I thank Carrie for the use of this library for this meeting. She's not here, but she left a very competent person in charge. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> any questions or anything you need? I'm in second. Um, so we have um, Rebecca Tuttle, Treasurer. Chief Monaco Police, Seth Knight, Fire, obviously Austin Saganowitz, Town Administrator, Miss Stu Rushala, <laughs> um, Head Squeeze of the Finance Committee, head squeeze. and Peter, Peter O'Malley. And we also have with us Sherry Haver and Jim O'Reilly, Dr. O'Reilly from, I said, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. O'Reilly from Fletcher's Regional School District. So just to open up, everybody knows, I see some familiar faces. Um, it's, been a, it's been a grueling process, and I don't want to try to hide that fact. Uh, we've gone through some, a terrible year um, as far as resources. Um, I, I, I've been saying it over and over that um, it appears that this year there is no more rabbit to come out of the hat. Uh, this is where Rutland needs, obviously, your support. I certainly support the two and a half override. I won't speak for everybody. Uh, we know that we need it. Uh, we know we have to get back to having our operations fully staffed and be able to do the work that we have to do. Um, so with that, um, again, I thank you all for coming. And any questions you may have, just please feel free to fire away. These guys can answer anything. <laughs> You're not off that. I'm going to start with just something. Um, so there has been a lot of discussion on social media. And I think some people might be confused about the override that they think that it is actually an additive when really the override, like it's gonna add more than what we actually really need. Whereas it's actually just gonna bring everybody to the budget to keep, keep the course, really. I think some people were just thinking, why do I wanna vote for this override? Because why do I need three more librarians and yeah. three more police officers and all the, it's, it's not added. It's so that we can actually make our budgets and make everything work. And for some of our departments, it's the bare minimum still. So that was and just that a concern on social media. Understood. And thank yeah. you for that. Um, yeah, certainly not to add a, a bunch of positions in town. It's actually to put us back where we were uh, several years ago. Um, we want to just bring our departments, certainly public and safety, public works, all of them, town buildings, everybody. Uh, we want to bring them back up to snuff so we can just keep operating successfully. So thank you for that. <coughs> My question is, how did it go off the rails? If we were once a float in the black, how did we end up here? Well, I think as much as anything, uh, economy changes. It doesn't get better. <clears throat> it's gotten worse. We all know oil has gone up. Electricity has gone up. Well, that's happened for the town as well. Any place that has um, contracts with unions or for supplies or whatever it is, if you had it at a point in time when you cut it and it was still okay to be able to spend, if you don't bring that spend back up, the spend is going to elevate. It's just going to increase. It just happens. Um, and if you don't keep up with it, you get behind. Now just, so I hope that answers the question. It got off the rails simply because the economy is what it is and it does what it does. Um, if that doesn't answer your question, stop. Well, I, I just have a, I have a B. Um, <clears throat> so it was my understanding that we got some money from the uh, infrastructure COVID money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, through the grapevine, I've heard that it went, it was supposed to go to repairing the pipes so that when we have heavy rains, the runoff doesn't, you know, so that we don't, don't get overcharged later down the road with Worcester. And I totally get that. But is that what happened? And how much did we get? What? So the, the COVID money itself? Yeah. Yeah, the COVID money, we got about $2.6 million. And what but did we really do with that? it really had nothing to do with, with Enterprise. That's called ARPA, American Recovery. But right. it's nothing to do with the, uh, the water and sewer of the Enterprise. Right, but it was just like a... 
in my circles, it, I was told that it was, you know, that we were going to allocate it to repair the pipes so that it would reduce the amount of money that the town has to spend to Worcester for the processing. And so I said, okay, well, that makes sense. But then I never heard any follow-up, like, from the town where the money actually went. It did not go to repairing, you know, it didn't go for the, for the enterprises. It did not go for that. Holden, okay. as you know, did file for a lawsuit, and they won that lawsuit as far as being overcharged for their discharge. Right. Um, Rutland was not on that bandwagon, but we're, we're reaping the benefit of the cost reduction for that treatment okay. of transport. Okay, good. Um, and we're still going through that process. It's not a done deal yet. But um, that being said, that work is not um, tax base related. Okay. okay. Can, I, can I add something to that? We did um, bar borrow uh, $3 million two years ago, I think, for uh, water and sewer repairs. And they did some, I wish Joe was here, but they did repair some where they were having water leaks um, with that money. The ARPA money uh, we have, and the board through the board of selectmen and the and the town administrator have, um, uh, what is it called? Just like picked projects um, to to do with that money around town. Like one of them is to um, in, improve uh, the broadband in town. Um, improve so it's it was decided on by the board of selectmen as to what we're going to do with that ARPA money. Um, so the, the two things that you're talking about, I believe, are totally unrelated. The pipes in the ground was for water and sewer enterprise alone, and we borrowed money for that. The ARPA money, we are doing other projects around town. That can't be dumped into the budget because they're one-time funds. So that, because we'll have a, a structural deficit, is that the right word? Right. Right. If we keep just putting money from our savings to our budget to keep it going, so. And that's a, that is an issue that you have to be aware of, you have to be concerned of all the time. There's been conversations, as you probably all read, there's uh, money that's put aside annually into uh, a reserve fund um, to be able to uh, be available in case there's a real significant emergency. And the thought is, well, maybe we should take some of that to offset the budget issues here. Well, once you start doing that, uh, like you're saying, it's, it's one-time revenue. If you have expenses, if you're paying for oil, it's not one-time expense. It's always there, always coming back. And once you take the one-time revenue and you pay that bill, the bill comes back the next year, you don't have the money because you spent it. So yeah, it's gone. Yeah, I agree that, with that. Yeah. So you have to be, we have to be cautious about that process and how it works and what we need to be able to do with that. Um, I want to address one question on the, on the budget itself. <coughs> how do we get here and um, additive and not additive. In August of last year, I think we went out to the departments and we gave them, uh, the town administrator gave them the task of defining what it is they need <coughs> to be able to man manage and maintain services to the town. What do they need? So back a few years ago, there was a, a level of service that was being delivered. And that has been um, constantly cut year after year. So the request was, let's go back and take a look at where we are and tell me what you need to be able to get right again. So that created a budget that we called the needs budget. Um, we looked at what the revenues were that, were that we think are coming in. And there's a dynamic with revenues. Uh, we had a meeting on Thursday, and we're not quite clear yet as to what some of the revenues are. We have a pretty good idea, but it's a dynamic, and it's changing. So, uh, we look at the difference between what the needs budget is and what the revenues are, and that creates an override. That request creates a request for an override. Now, the override is going to go ahead and, and uh, establish a new baseline rate for tax rate for the town. And it will go ahead and tax rate may not be right that if I'm wrong, just, just let me know. Um, but it, it, it to creates uh, a, a new charge, if you will, for the town to the, to, the, um, to the residents. And it creates it at that level. That's what it's going to be going forward. And the question that people have asked about that rate is, how long is that going to last? 
fact of the matter is that will last three to five years. At which time, if spending keeps going the way that it is, then we're going to have to look at it again. Who knows what's going to be needed at that point. But the idea here is that it creates a, a, a new uh, levy uh, base from which we can go ahead and achieve the, um, the, the revenue that we need to be able to pay the bills, pay this bill. Um, it, it's, if it doesn't happen, if the two and a half old right does not happen, uh, these, these folks have already created a budget that says these are the things that have to go away for me to be able to stay within that number. And those things, that is out there. Um, and it's not going to be pretty. Um, there are conversations about what goes away, what closes down. Um, there's conversations about, um, I'm sure it's, it's in the uh, social media, it's in the rumor mill that it's police will have uh, state police here on the, on the evenings, there'll be no firing on the, uh, on the weekends, um, library is going to close, council on aging is going to close. There's a bunch of stuff out there, uh, and we won't really know what it is until after we find out. I mean, we have an idea, but we won't really know practically what's going to be these things um, until we get to the vote and find out what happens on Monday. I, can I just go back to her sure. original question? You're part of this I, group. I think the answer, and we've talked about this on the Finance Committee for a number of years, it's kind of, I would say, simple math, and I always refer to my Wachusett math, but when the school budget's over half of our whole budget, over 50%, mm -hmm. we have the ability in town, we have other revenues, but we have the ability in town to raise the tax rate only 2.5% of the year, right. I mean, per year. And the school comes in every year at six, seven, eight, and this year at yeah. nine and a half percent, mm -hmm. doesn't take you long to figure out there's where the money's going. Okay, and, so and how we do, do we not have, that role? And what happens is, even though we support that budget and we and, and it goes forward because that's what a bulk of the people that attend town meeting vote for, that's their right, we don't have the money left over to support the other departments. So for 10, 12, 15 years now, every year after the budget is set at the town meeting, all the other departments keep suffering and they've been going downhill, downhill, downhill. We've kept taking things away. So what this override is doing is just trying to bring that back up to a point where it's functional, where the department heads think we should be to have a reasonable service level for the taxpayer. And if the school just keeps coming in every year at that high number, we can't so we just can't keep up with it without an override. Okay, so one of my questions is that unless you drag your butt into one of these seats, the information's hard to come by. And it's not out there. And I think if more people understood mm -hmm. at the rate of the school demand and the rate of our town decline, we might be getting a different vote at town meetings. I live in a, I live in a house that has no, uh, I, don't, I don't get a lot of public services. I'm on a well, I'm on a septic, I have no children in school. Um, I don't even have a fire hydrant on my street. I've never called 911, I would if I needed to. And I'm not a frequent flyer with the police department. And so my taxes, if the 2.5 goes through, mm -hmm. it's going to be close to $9,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's one of those things where I live in a nice house. I probably have the means. Conversely, I have a friend who worked really hard. She's on Social Security. Her rent just went up. Now her landlord is saying, well, we're going to pass this money on to you. And she's still making $1,700 a month. Right. Now you tell me how those people are supposed to maintain residence right. in Rutland. Right. You know, I wish there was a way. Can I just answer one thing real quick? Sure. You know, this comes up a lot, too. People, people talk about... Um, the water and sewer bill or the water and sewer. Now, if you just mentioned you're not, you're on your own well, your own septic system. 
So you're not paying anything towards the town system, I, and I want to qualify that a little bit, you are paying a little bit in your taxes for it, but basically you're not paying for that through a town service because the, the water and sewer system down is paid by the rate payers. All the people that have those services are paying all those bills. And that's what they spoke about earlier through its uh, um, enterprise fund to take care of that. So that equation is, yes, your house is off those services. You're at some place that doesn't have them. And, but the ones that are on it are the ones that are real. They're paying 98% of the bill. And I'm saying that because in the taxes there is some money in there because the town buildings and the town services such as the schools receive some of that water and sewer service obviously like this building does. So you as a taxpayer benefit from the town buildings and town facilities so you have a little bit of that in your taxes but the bulk of it is paid by the rate payers. So, you know what I'm saying? You can't equate that that you're paying a big chunk to help support that when that's not where it's coming from. Right. Okay. So, so the I only other thing I'd add to address the question is the fact that there's a um, there are formulas in place for certain things. Um, why can't we just go ahead and not do something? Well, if the Massachusetts state law will require a minimal level of of contribution for things that need to be able to be done. I found out the other day that in some of the town offices, there's a minimum requirement to have uh, services available. And if you don't fund it, then you're in violation of Massachusetts state law. Same thing with the schools. The schools have got a, a, a significant amount of <coughs> uh, restriction placed upon them on how this money that they, that they budget and spend gets distributed. Uh, population, number of people that are attending <coughs> school, there's a minimum uh, um, service level. Local contribution. Local contribution, thank you. Um, and those kinds of things are dictated by the state, not the monies, the distribution. There, there will be some things to, that the state will dictate that need to be able to be done, and it adds into the budget. But uh, you're required by law to do certain things, so you just can't you can see in the when you see the warm uh, for the town meeting, there are three or four articles that would uh, indicate that you're voting for um, school budgeting money, and you are. Uh, but it's not like you can go ahead and you can say, "I don't, I'm not going to pay that." No, you, I don't you, mind paying for education. I'm just saying that, um, you know, and and fortunately. I have the means, but there are people in this town. There are retired people in this town that are living on Social Security. They can't afford. To, they can't afford the ten dollars extra a week right. to cover this. Right. And and I, you know, it's been my fortune that I have spent a lot of time with these people, and they are worried. It's gas money to go see their sister in the nursing home. Or it's this 2.5. Uh -huh. oh, so I how do you deal sure. with that? So if if I can, there is through the assessor's office, there are exemptions available for elderly and um, seniors and, um, and people with, that are under a certain income level. And I would really advise them just to go to the assessor's website or go to the assessors and see what they can um, apply for. Whether they're eligible for exemptions, it could be up to a thousand dollars that they could get off of their um, taxes. Now, is this well, like in my, the case of my friend in rents? It's not her; it's her landlord passing the bill on to her. But her income level, if like her, if her income level is a, it's it's minimal. Actually, that wouldn't be her. So then she's not paying her rent. She, oh, she's paying, all right. Okay. So the landlord's going to boost her rent, yeah. which he already has in anticipation. Mm. So a local, you know, a recent conversation I had with her is, how, I, okay, so I can't make but one trip to Big Y a week. I know. Um, and I can't drive out to Auburn to see my sister. Nancy Nichols, um, who's our Council on Aging Director, is working on programs through their, their friends group and uh, seniors, helping seniors. Um, group as well so I would advise her to kind of that her thought process with that is to assist some of the seniors because she's 
she's right there on the forefront right. of, she sees of what the too. seniors yeah, yeah exactly so I think she's working on programs to assist for the seniors in the community that, that are having those problems. So I would advise her to talk to Nancy. And renter, renters are one thing, most definitely. It's a landlord that pays property taxes. Right. And if they ch so choose, they can pass along to their tenants. Uh, I'm concerned about the homeowner. The, as you said, somebody that's been in town for a long time, and <clears throat> they're looking at an increase in their taxes, their tax rate, and they're trying to make a decision as to whether or not they pay the taxes, or they get their pills, yeah. or they get, they have the food that they exactly. need to be able to eat. Um, that, that scares the hell out of me. But th there's... But I what's mean, the as, solution? Well, so as uh, um, Becky was saying, for those people that own property, go down, go to the tax assessor's office, talk to them about what your situation is, talk to Nancy. Nancy will help. <coughs> Uh, guide them as to how they would go ahead. They could go ahead and get some relief. Now, is that information widely available? That's why we're doing these. <laughs> you know I mean, we do have we do have um, all these budget documents up on the website. Yeah. Um, we try we we try to have outreach. I mean, they can go to the senior center. The senior center is available for them and ask the questions of Nancy. Um, I mean without doing mailings which we right now the budget isn't doesn't support mailings to everybody in town um we try to have the budget hearings and and put things on the website and <coughs> we could do inserts in the tax bill possibly but then that that costs money as well so um and, and as much as anything you guys are communicators you have a friend go talk to them let them know no. there, are, there are things that they can do um, the town's not here, the town administration is not here to take everybody's money. It's only here to be able to uh, balance the cost of the services that are required. And it becomes the town's choice as to how much of those services they want. Do they want the full level of service that um, the department has been asked to, 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 to go ahead and find or define, or do they want to have a reduced service? And then if they have a reduced service, then there will be consequences with that. Well, everything has consequences. You want the services, you pay more money. You don't want the, to pay more money, you don't have those services. It's just, it's a fact of life. Just like going to the, I'm sorry, there was a question in the back. Yes, my name is Mike Suarez. I'm a new resident in town. Been here for about a over a year. Live over in Pioneer Circle, Bryce Estates. Welcome. That's the board of assessors thought about setting up an account where we could donate and she could look at the elderly people that can make that you know mm -hmm. can pay that tax increase and take money and put it straight mm -hmm. into their account to help offset um i think do you want it yeah um i run the council on aging right. and it's my first month but there are um, <coughs> people at the senior center and I welcome you to come in and to offer that. Okay, there is a fund over there, you know, elders in need, and it's there. So please come on over Monday through Friday, nine to three. I think that the assessor's office is, is control or uh, over uh, seen by the mass 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 general laws. Okay. So I don't. I'm not sure how how they can off, off their own. Um, benefit uh, or, or reduction in taxes to seniors. It's better to go through the council. It wouldn't be a reduction right. in taxes. It would be since you're the assessor, you're actually making sure that they qualify for it. Right. So right. then you'd be like, listen, let's say it's right. seventeen thousand a year minimum that has to be coming in. This person right. is like at twenty-five. Yeah. They're near the cusp. They could benefit from the help. Right. Right. Hence, boom, here's some money. Now it's like you're not paying the increase. For this year. Yeah, we also have a senior work off program that you know seniors can come and work for the or a representative of them can come and work for the town and, and earn up to seven fifty off their taxes. So that's another program that's out there. Um, and I, they can also I mean I'm sure the C, if we get a lot of donations, the senior center will work with the assessors to do that um, equation as to what their income benefit level will be. If if I may um, interrupt um, because actually Mr. Vishala and the woman next to Dr. Riley brought up the school budget. So Jim, I think this is a, a good time now. Yes, it was increased 9.55%, we all know that. 
but we also, I think, for the most part, we know that Rutland had the the highest amount of new new kids enrolled in the school. So, if you could just address some of that stuff, and also I'd like to, um, after Jim's done, um, have the doc department heads just let everybody know what we're in fear of losing and what we will be able to keep um, with, if the two and a half passes. So, Doctor, it's okay to do from here. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so I'd say there are a couple things in this particular year that impacted Rutland more than the other uh, four communities in the regional school district. And a couple of them, as it was mentioned earlier, they, they're not in the district's control. So it's not, it's not just us asking for discretion, discretionary funding where we're saying give us more money. Some of them are determined by the state, and then some of them are determined just by the sheer number of students that are attending the school. So by the regional agreement, your proportional share or how much you pay for the school budget, that goes up and down depending on the number of students who we count in the school system in October. And so this year, um, where the other towns, Princeton, Sterling, um, actually were declining, uh, Holden had a 0.12% increase and Paxton had a 0.16 increase, Rutland actually had a 5%, more than 5% increase. And so that meant you, you sent an additional 78 students to our schools this year. And when that happens, you know, it, effectively there could be a, a, you know, an, a much a greater increase in what your proportional share of the budget is. And so that's one thing. And then it was also mentioned uh, minimal local contribution. And that's a significant part of what the town's assessment is as well. And that gets determined by a formula by the state, which I honestly couldn't explain to you, <laughs> but basically what it is is the state looks at the town and says, what can um, Rutland afford in terms of their minimal local contribution? Because when you, when you that gets set, the state looks at it and either the state funds the majority of the bill or the town and it kind of goes up and down. This year, the state determined that Rutland could pay a higher percentage of our, our minimal funding. And so um, for Rutland, that was an increase of um, over um, $594,000, and that was a 7.32 uh, increase. And so those two factors, they're not the only factors that impact you know, the budget and the school budget going up, but they are significant. And they're not... We, we honestly just don't have any control over that. Those are all either determined by kids coming to school or what the state is saying about your minimal uh, local contribution. We are much closer um, when you look at town assessments where we're fairly close and some of it depends on um, if we have ability to offer additional revenues as we move forward this year. Um, but the town managers have requested of us to try to keep it to 4%. We're over 4%, but not by an ex extraordinary margin in the other towns. Here we are. But the reason why we are here is because of those two factors. Um, and I just wouldn't want that to get lost. And I, I would say I'm here um, as an advocate for the schools, but I would just also say we're, we're trying to build trust here. And I know we haven't had a great track record recently. Um, and I hear everything that people are saying. I know these are difficult choices. I know they're impacting real people, and they're worried about it. Uh, I can only just share with you what we put forth in the budget. We really tried to base on what it was costing us to run the school district. And then we looked at a couple of things that gave us pause or we got concerned about if we didn't address. And so what I would say just specifically for Rutland, um, you know, we, we advocated to add three teachers. But if we didn't, I'll give you an example. Um, in Naquag, we'd have kindergarten classes of about 26. Uh, and, and Naquag in, in, um, uh, in second grade, they'd have classes around the size of 25. And at Glenwood, you would have had a, a classroom in third grade of over 26. And so we're trying to do our, uh, our homework and do the right thing to make sure class sizes aren't getting too high. And it is benefiting Ruff, Rutland specifically in those schools. They're part of those additional positions that we're advocating for. And it's really to keep it level, because if we don't, you know, I've said this on record, I, I'm worried about the schools, you know, I'll be honest with you, I'm worried about um, what's happened in the last couple of years, and, you know, I, it was interesting to hear from the other departments about how things have been cut. That's been going on in the school district, I know it doesn't feel like it, 
but it has been going on for the last 10 years and there are things like librarians, there are things like health teachers, there are things that once were in the district that no longer exist. And so what we're trying to do is try <coughs> to make sure at least um, we're holding to what the school committee has recommended in terms of class size because there's a lot we don't have. Um, but I also just would, would say I understand it's a lot and um, but we're hopeful that we can explain or answer questions why we have advocated for this amount. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Can, can, I, can I just say one thing? No. I know you're, you're saying the number of students have gone up this year. I understand that because we have the net minimum contribution. But <clears throat> I'm pretty sure it was last year. Maybe it was the year before that. But the year, our, our student population went down by 100 and I forgot the number of what they told us. But it was over it was 120 or 30 students. Mm -hmm. The budget never went down. Sure. We still contributed more than the 2.5% state allowed increase. We still contributed four or five, six percent in those two years when our student population dropped quite a bit. So it just, uh, I guess my point is it doesn't seem that, I understand the new, the new students there, but it just, it, ha it didn't go down and say, okay, we've got to go back up. It's been going up, 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 up for 15, 20 years now. And I, I'll be honest with you, I don't have a good hold. No, I understand. I'm not saying you do. I'm just, no, I, I just I, want, I hear you. like this lady said, she wants, where's the information? And well, people don't hear that information all the time. But we don't. You're, you're right. No, that's what I'm saying. I'm trying, yeah. we hear it at the finance meetings, but it's tough for us to be able to get some of that <laughs> stuff out. But. Well, not to be the thorn in the side, but <coughs> um, <laughs> uh, it's my understanding that none of the schools in our area have librarians or public access to libraries anymore. And then when I heard that this library was in jeopardy, I got a little cranky. Because if we don't have libraries in our schools, and this library is on the chopping block, well then what the hell? Excuse the French. <laughs> I mean, there's got to be place for our seniors to have internet and Technology. I have several people that say, can you help me with my phone? Mm. Where is that service if it's not here? <coughs> we have a, uh, things going on at the senior center where they borrow books from here because it's the only library and they do a book club. And, and it's a pretty active, wonderful senior center. But if we don't have public access to libraries at school, where do our kids get it if they don't have internet access? Or like during the pandemic, I remember pulling up and we had internet access and kids would be parked in their cars to do their work. Mm. So I, I, I guess my thing is if we don't have a public library and we don't have school libraries, what's the alternative and mm -hmm. how detrimental is that to our community? Mm -hmm. I agree. So, from the perspective of the, the needs budget, I mean, that's what you're talking about. Right. Like what's the need? And the needs budget declared um, these services cost this amount of money, which generated the number that is the override. So, you're making a very good point for the override, quite frankly. Okay. Sorry? I just want to speak to the reduction in students. So, when COVID years were happening and we had that significant reduction, Lots of kids were going to private school. Lots of kids were getting homeschooled. Well, the same thing happened with the other towns. So it wasn't that there was a significant downturn in Rutland and everybody else stayed the same, where you would have seen a decrease in our, in our required contribution. When everybody goes down, everybody's percentage stayed at the same percentage, first. Second, when you to look at 120 kids over the course of you know, 12, 13, 14 grades that we cover, you're looking at 10 kids per grade, and you have five classes of each grade, so it's two kids per class, and Dr. Riley's telling you that there's 26 kids per class, and we're supposed to have 19. So simply taking two kids out of a class isn't a significant reduction. You know, it doesn't change your budget. <coughs> we still need the same amount of teachers just because we had 120 less kids. I have a question about um, students before the pandemic, before this drop, students that do attend other schools. Now I know there are situations where they still need special ed services and there are out of district placement, but what about kids who are in private school 
that don't need those services? And what happens to the money that we allocate for them? I, I feel like I know we have to have a spot for them here, just in case they change their mind, right, if they come back from private school. But I'm just wondering, like, how many students, do we know how many are actually at so, other schools? Right. And so what happens to the money that is yeah, earmarked we, for them? We, we don't get money for them, so they're not, um, no. they're not counted on our census. Okay. And so when I refer to, like, uh, what they do is they uh, do what they call SIMS reporting in October. We do it again, I think it's um, in April. Um, but the official one that the state uses is they capture everyone who's physically in your schools and residents of your communities, um, and they give us a reimbursable, they give us an amount of revenue based on those numbers. Um, it's a good point, and I would say to you, um, and it refers back to this gentleman's uh, uh, question as well, I think we need to um, look at who's not going to our schools and why. I think especially when you get to high school, we see a drop off in our students who are coming to uh, Wachusett, and I think we have to start asking the question why, and. Um, to make sure that we're offering them a program and experience that they, they would want to pursue. So I think that's a, that's a good thing. And not to get too deep in the weeds for people, too. I think we have to, and I'll be presenting this in one of the <laughs> school community meetings left in the year, uh, in May and June probably, but um, we also have to look at population because I think specifically here in Rutland, you're going to have an explosion. And we have to be prepared for it. Um, and we have to have some planning around that. And I think similarly in Holden, there's going to be population growth. I don't think it will be as extreme in here as here in Rutland, but I do think when. So we probably have a proposal of some population studies we're going to do as a school district. So we're just very much prepared for that. But it is what I worry about with Rutland, because if your proportional share is going up every year, uh, some of this stuff that's happened, and it looks like you're going to have a, it will look like on paper that you're having a larger increase um, but a lot of it's going to be due um, to an increase in, in students in the population. Uh, and my hope is, is that we could find a way where it can necessitate having to build more schools, you know. I mean, I think we're trying to look at other opportunities. Do we have a way so we can have school choice within the district? So if a Rutland resident is interested in sending their child to one of the other schools in, say, Princeton or Sterling or things like that, that's an option if they wanted to do that. So we're looking for those things. But I have to say, some of the things that we're talking about today in terms of population, I don't see them going away. Thanks. I, um, I'd like to have the Chief Monaco get up and maybe give us a couple of uh, couple things. What we, where will we will go back to if it's passed and where you feel like it if it's not? Um, so I already do not have enough funding to effectively operate a police department at Y23. I've, I've announced at several meetings, the finance committee, the select board, I, my, all my expense accounts ran out of money in October uh, of the fiscal year. Uh, so we've, we've been carried along by donations from the Devereux School for the rest of the fiscal year. Um, Personnel-wise, we're, we're doing okay. We're still, I need at least another body to cover shifts in an effective manner. So if, um, if this does not go through, and the, these are the cuts that I'm looking at, um, we're looking at cutting my administrative assistant, who currently only works 32 hours a week. I need her there 40 hours a week, but <coughs> we're going to cut that from 32 down to 24, plus uh, no COLA, no step increase. Um, I'd be forfeiting several thousand dollars of my own pay because um, I can't cut somebody else and not cut myself. Um, what else we got? As far as wages go, we would be cutting a half of a patrolman's position, a full-time position. So we would lay that person off in um, well, January 1st. Uh, also be cutting three or three remaining part-time officers, um, three, three guys that have worked for this department for many years. Uh, one of them is, I think, just recently, or is about to, <coughs> 20 years of service with us, and we're gonna tell them, hey, thanks, see you later. See you later. Um, two other guys that, that work for us, um, you know, the, the part-time guys work a minimum of four shifts a month. They usually pull more than that, so they cover a lot of things for us, and they help out quite a bit. Um, and we'll be saying goodbye to all three of those, and, and half a full-time guy. Um, overtime would be cut for, cut to about thirty thirty seven thousand dollars for um, oh excuse me thirty three thousand dollars for the year so that would um, we're not going to backfill any any shifts our staffing right now is a two officer minimum 
So 24 seven, we have two officers on the street. Um, we, there's certain times of day where we're at the point where we need more than that, like the evening shift, we definitely need three people on the road and we try to keep it at three most of the time, but still our minimum staffing level is two. Uh, if, if this happens and I lose all that over time and lose that half a full-time officer and it would, minimum staffing is going to go back to one. So now you're looking at one police officer on the road covering a 36 square mile town with 10,000 people in it. So it's, uh, absolutely unsafe for for the public and the officer with uh, with no backup and if that happened you'll be seeing a lot more mutual aid from uh, other departments rolling in and as far as expenses like like i already said this year's expenses we've gone in october um, they're going to be cut even more and they'll probably be gone by september so and we'll be begging the devro school to please keep funding your municipal police department and they do not have to give us a dime they're gracious enough to give us a pretty substantial donation. And if they see, which, I mean, uh, they're aware of it, um, that donation is supposed to go to special programs and, you know, specialized training, equipment, you know, things to improve services and improve the department's relation with the town and um, community policing. But if, if they see that their donation is just funding an operating <coughs> budget, uh, they're not going to really be too happy about giving a donation to us. So, uh, so that's that's the cuts I'm looking at. Questions? Two back. Okay. Back. We got a question back there. Not not about what you just said. I tried to get a question before. <coughs> My name is Gene Cooper. I live in Grace, London Estates. Uh, I want to know if we could change the formula that people are getting taxed on the the assessed value of the house. Some people have higher assessments than others. I don't know why Rutland can't take an average of all the houses in Rutland, all the assessed values divided by a thousand, and whatever that number comes out to be, you times that by the 1.467, and everybody pays that same amount. Some people aren't going to like what I just said because if, if their taxes going to come up, some people are going to like it because their taxes come down. I don't get preferential treatment. I'm not going to get an extra policeman coming up and down my street, I don't get extra street cleaning, so everybody pays the same, everybody gets the same services. So it's just a proposal to, if the town could change it to make it more equitable. Don't have the wealthier people fund for the not so wealthy people. It should be, of course, that we're in this together as a town. And then I just would like the doctor to uh, answer questions about what happened to the 1.6, 1.9 million dollars that were misappropriated, disappeared from the Wachusett Regional School District, and now you want me to give you another $1.3 million when you haven't accounted for the last two budgets, 91, 92, 92, 93. To me, it's the definition of insanity. Mm -hmm. To give you more money not knowing where the previous money went. I'll address the first question, you can do the second one. Sure. <laughs> the, um, the assessments are, are based on Mass General Law, so that we, in Massachusetts, we base it on the assessed value of the house we, I mean, of, of each um, taxpayer's house. We can't change mass general law. We can, you can reach out to your senator or um, state representative and see if there's something they can do, but we're governed by mass general, general law. The assessors do go out and do cyclical reevaluations of, of homes, and they've, they've come up because the house, the selling prices of house, houses have skyrocketed over the last few years so that's where the assessed value comes up the tax rate goes down <coughs> um, so you uh, usually and your tax rate tax taxes go up because of the budgets that get passed and I encourage people to come to the town meeting and you know so you know what you, where your taxes mm -hmm. are going but there's only one tax rate yes there's right. only one tax there's rate. only one tax rate right. so everybody is paying the same based upon the value of the house now if the house that if the value of the house changes then you might end up paying more because your house value may increase. This is, this is not market, based on real not. estate or, or on water and sewer. This is based on the accessories. What I just said, if we're all in the same boat together, then everybody pays the same because we're all getting the same services. I'm not getting any preferential treatment. Right. And the person who pays less right now is not getting less services. Everybody's getting the same, so everybody should pay the same. That's all I said. Make it more equitable. Sure. But you want to have it set that you know, the higher you go, the more you have to pay, and, you know, tax the rich. In value. I understand what you're saying. 
Jim. So, um, just to share a little bit about our budget and uh, what's happened historically. I, I, I took over in July of this year. And so when I first came in, there was a report uh, and at the school, for the school committee meeting in July, there was a vote on transfers that needed to be made because according to the business records at that time, there had been uh, over expenditures of $1.65 million. And I think it's important to know that what school committee did is they voted for that amount to be uh, balanced out and zeroed out from transfers from revolving accounts. So things like school choice, um, you know, circuit breaker, other accounts that we have as revenues that have to be voted by school committee but were applied and on paper zeroed out th that overspending, you know. Um, we were in a, a position when I came in, and we didn't have an active business and finance director. We were able to hire one, thankfully, in November. Um, but, and Michelle Brise is her name. And she needed to come in. And that entire year, um, there hadn't been uh, the type of record keeping that needed to happen. And she needed to go into the system. We actually just closed out FY22. Um, what was estimated to be needed in transfers of $1.65 million has ended up to be about $400,000. Now, still serious, still overspending by $400,000, but that's where that number is now. Um, I would just <coughs> share that people know about that number. Uh, I've been talking about <coughs> it since August in my first meeting coming into as um, a superintendent. And I think with the school committee's support, we haven't tried to hide anything. Is it um, poor management on behalf of the district? Have we done poor de develop, uh, budget development? Absolutely. You know, and so what we're trying to do, though, is to be honest about that and then be as transparent as possible. Uh, but do we have work to do to improve people's trust in us? We do. We do. And the, everything is public here. So the school committee meetings are public. You can see them on TV, you can walk in the high school when they're being, and I think most of the time they have public comments in the mm -hmm. meeting, right? Absolutely. Twice. So if you have an issue, um, feel free to go down to Wachusa, go into the meeting, and raise the concern. I, I, a lot of them are very valid concerns. And give them something, give Jim something to, to think about what he needs to do going into the next year and how we address it. So um, feel free. Yeah. Um, just to add on to that, um, as far as this year's budget is concerned, we had this overspending because our budget was not properly set up in years past. Numbers were placed in lines without giving thought to what had been spent previously. This year, Michelle and Dr. Riley went through line by line by line and looked at our expenditures and properly funded to have a properly funded budget this year. So what you're voting on this year at least is based on what we had for expenditures. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. So I, I do need a little bit of clarification. So the two and a half override gets us to a level we were at two to three years ago or keeps us flat for next year? Like the Chief said, if he ran out of expenses last year in October, I want to get him back to where he's whole. All right. So, and I understand that. That's a good question because from the perspective of what we asked that the chiefs to do and the other department heads is to budget based upon what they need to provide services to the town. Not what they're doing right now because what they, we know, they know it's not enough. But just identify what it is that you need to be able to deliver um, your charter to the town. And that's where we are. We totaled all that up and that came up to $2 million. And that's what the override is intending to do. Now, the override, once it's in place, will raise the tax level. And that, uh, based upon the projection of one of the members of the uh, Finance Committee, they went ahead and they looked at what the spending projection would be and what the revenue projection based upon the override would be. And that um, balance would occur for the next three to five years. So it'll stay within the, the realm of being able to pay the bills and you won't end up with running out of money for three to five years. But after that, all bets are on. As the, the school's got a dynamic that right. they have to be able to refer uh, or relate to and react to. Um, 
fuel, Joe's fuel budget goes crazy just because, you know, oil is more expensive. Yeah. So Electricity. That's the, that's the second part of my question. So what have we learned from this, right? How do we, how do we prepare for the future? How do we look three to five years down the road or we just wait and tax the residents again more or do we look for another source of revenue for the town? How do we, it, it's simple math, right? Like my right. eloquent gentleman here in front of me said, it's, if you spend more than you got coming in, you're going to be back in the same boat again. So how do we get more coming in? without, you know, bleeding the, the turnips. I'm going to stand up. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Austin, uh, new town administrator. So uh, that's a, a great point about uh, projecting out. And this three to five years is obviously based off of some assumptions that a finance committee member made based off of, you know, historic trends. Um, the future. But I think that's certainly something that we need to continue to do. And that's certainly a best practice that I want to bring um, to the whole budget process altogether in terms of Starting the budget process early, uh, sitting down with every department head and looking at their uh, their needs for the departments, and then projecting that that out. So if we're looking at staffing increases, if we're looking at uh, police department is a perfect example. You think about the post commission and some of the requirements that has come from the state level and mandating for the for the police department. All of our departments and and certainly the school district are experiencing uh, changing needs uh, for the community um, and services that are provided. So. Uh, what I hope to do in this process is to develop uh, likely what will be a five-year um, financial model for our town services. And then we can present that in a transparent way mm -hmm. to the community and say, this is what it costs to run a town. This is what it's going to cost over the next few years. So you're not surprised a month ahead of town meeting and asked mm -hmm. to provide <coughs> extra funding to provide these services. So um, you know, that's what I look to do. And then certainly I think... There's other things that we can do. Um, our town departments do a lot to collect data and metrics for the services that they provide. Um, let's present that data in our budget document to show you exactly how these services are changing. Uh, I was here yesterday for the yard sale, uh, and I walked through this building and was able to see exactly how much this library does to support the community. And after talking with the library director, I mean, the amount of visits that has increased over the years, of course she needs more resources to be able to continue providing that. Let's show that data. Um, let's show the amount of calls that are increasing for our public safety department and, 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 and reflect why we're asking for additional funding for an additional uh, patrolmen or additional firefighter. So, um, but we need to do that in a collaborative and transparent way. So again, we're starting early. Um, we are working and having public meetings to talk about this. I think this is a good practice that we should continue, override or not, um, and have that uh, and have that deliberative um, communication with the community. Um, and then, of course, you <coughs> all know this community a lot better than I do and a lot better than maybe, well, some of the town staff are residents, so they also know the community fairly well, too. But you have a lot of good ideas. Um, how can we s solicit input from residents um, to match those needs that you have from our town town departments. So that's I don't know if that answered your question. Mm -hmm. sure. Quick question. Uh, maybe about a year or two ago, they were looking to close the library. There was a twenty thousand dollar gap in the budget, and the question came up: Well, can't we do a fundraiser, or can't we contribute? My wife and I want to contribute, and the lady at the library said, even if you gave me. A five thousand dollar check or a ten thousand dollar check, I can't keep it. I have to give it to the general fund of Rutland, and they can do with it what they want. Is that true? I mean, I want to support the library. She said we can't keep it because we suggested in my blue heaven. If anybody remembers that movie, how they put those five gallon buckets of, uh, of water and collecting nickels and dimes. She said we couldn't. We couldn't uh, keep that money. So I have to go into the general fund. First of all, what the hell? We want to save blood. Nope. It doesn't work that way. Yeah, so I think, you know, that's that's a challenge that on the municipal finance side, we have to follow master on law for, for how we take some of these Boston receipts. has too much to say now. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, you know, I've got to get out. You know, so there's a lot of good ideas, especially, if, you know, how can we, uh, you know, the program that you mentioned, or actually, no, it was you, um, that mentioned, uh, you know, sort of a, a separate pot of money for senior tax relief. So the community that I just came from, town of Acton, they actually have that program. And it's a separate committee made up of residents uh, that uh, it's, a, it's a pot of money that every year they solicit 
uh, donations, if you will. Um, so there are, you know, sort of mechanisms mechanisms that we can put in place uh, to try to help people in a way. But certainly, if you want to if you want to give a gift or a donation, uh, technically that just goes into a gift or donation account. Yeah, there's uh, a library gift gift fund that she no, could yeah, which is kind of like what the what the police department has a gift fund um, that supplements their supplies. The library mm -hmm. also has a gift fund that supplements their so it does operations. Go into the general fund? No. If you made a donation it would go into the gift fund. Yeah. But, you know, but certainly that's not obviously the answer to you know fund the overall operations right. of, exactly. of and that's why, you know, we have to be honest and transparent in our budget and tell you exactly what it needs to make sure that this building and all town services are, are provided. Because these are the services that you expect and that you deserve. And I will say, like, yeah, so we have a gift fund, and I'm not quite sure what we could use all that money for. Some things can't be used for certain things, right? So for paying staff or whatever. But we do also have a Friends of a Library, and they can be gifted money, and it, it can only be used for certain things, too. So. Supplies. Maybe you should put out a list of all the different things and what the money can be used for. So I can pick and choose. Yeah, I mean, you can choose how, like, people donate and they can choose how they want to, where they want it to go, but yeah, it, some things just can't go towards staff or towards certain things. Right. Can I ask a question? I would like to know from the superintendent, um, you know, with the old rich being 400000 and I know it's probably you're going to get that, how can we hold the, what would your suggestion for us as a town? to hold the school accountable to stay with the budget. Yeah, I think, um, I, I know in the time I've been here, the school committee's been very vigilant and working with us. We're still, um, we, we put in place a budget freeze this last January, January, the beginning of February. And we did that because, and Sherry made a great point earlier, we were worried about how the budget was being developed, in part, I look at the fact that we were over by 400, and yeah, they should have been tracking it more closely and put a freeze in place like we did this year in February. But I think part of it too was they weren't properly um, capturing how much it, it took to run the district. You, you know what I mean? So we haven't gotten into it to the level I'd love to at some point. So it's, it's like, did they start with a, a wrong you know, kind of finish line in mind, or were they spending excessively? I don't, I don't have a good answer for you right now. I haven't been able to look at it um, as much as I'd like to. Um, even this year, you know, we're, we're behind. I mean, we just closed out FY22, and we're almost done with FY23. And so I feel like we're going to be in a good place starting FY24, you know, in terms of us tracking expenses, um, we've had good conversations and the school committee is invested, like in saying to us, look, we need this, you know, these reports on a, um, on a monthly basis and this is what we want to see and there's some policies like when we transfer between funds, we should be doing that several times a year, not just waiting until July. And so there's a lot of practices, I think, that both uh, we want to put in place um, as, a, as a district administration and school committees making sure we have in place to make sure we don't end up where we, where we were before. And so I don't, um, I feel like we're heading in the right direction. <coughs> uh, but I would say there's responsibility on the district side where they weren't, they weren't monitoring as closely as they needed to be. Some of it had to do with staffing. Um, you know, the business department in the school lost um, probably about four individuals who were really key to the department. And it's one of those things, um, <coughs> schools are behind, like we're never where businesses are in terms of our practices, where we really should be. Mm -hmm. Like right now, um, I shared some of our budget presentations and we had an audit, a firm came in and gave us recommendations on how to improve and school committee, um, they're the ones who asked for that. And it's good that they did, because we saw a lot of things that we, we shouldn't be doing. We, we rely way too much on paper. You know, we're moving piles to piles, and then you have human error, and things are happening. So we're right now just starting to get into like electronic workflows, things like that can be done on a, uh, on a, on a system instead of relying on particular individuals. Because what happened when those four people walked out the door is a lot of institutional knowledge, like they knew how to do their job because they've been doing it for 15 years, but when they left, no one else did. So we had a lot of like those single point of failures, right? 
Um, and so there was just a ton of work for us to do as a system to get away from that and to be in the position to report accurate numbers to school committee and make sure we're watching it. Um, I don't want to say this to you all, and I'm still worried about FY23. You know, I don't know where we're going to end up. I'm hoping that we're going to do a lot better than 400,000, but I'm very thankful when our new business director came in. She said, we need to freeze. Um, you know, that was, that was the right thing to do. Um, and, and it's one of the reasons why we were so insistent on trying to build this budget on actual expenses. Like she looked at what we were spending thus far in FY23 <coughs> and what we spent in FY22. Because we weren't doing that before. They were taking random percentages, like our test salary line was um, just multiplied by 3%. But the way, the way um, it works in, with unions and contracts and things, you have people who like move over lines and, and you know, they have step increases. So we were really doing things in a way that wasn't in our so best So how can we actually hold you accountable? What would, I mean, I know you're saying the school committee yep. ran an audit on you, mm -hmm. but what is our recourse as a town? Let's pretend you weren't the superintendent right. and our next superintendent was not a nice guy, yep. right? What would you say to us? Hey, this is how you could actually address them for going over budget. You gotta establish a line and hold them to it. Yeah. What's the process? Um, you want yeah. So, truly, there is not much you can do. Okay. Now, I've been on school committee for four years. We can ask for numbers. We can get the reports. If we don't get the right numbers, if people are not giving us the right information. There's nothing we can do. The, the extent of what school committee can do is evaluate the superintendent. You can't not pay them? <laughs> we can fire them I mean, if, there's, what, if, I there's, mean, if I hire if there's somebody problem, to do right. a job and they're not doing the job properly, yeah. I'll just tell them, well, pound sand, but. Well, right, there's a hire and fire process. But, mm -hmm. but beyond that, the evaluation of the superintendent is the extent of the recourse for school committee. He got a great evaluation this year, just so you know. <laughs> but, but beyond that, we did ask for an audit. We asked for an audit of human resources. We asked for an audit of the business office. We have had a complete re redo in, in central office. We have a new business manager. We have a new HR director. We have a new SPED director. We have it. It's everyone is new, new superintendent. I can tell you that moving forward, I have great confidence that we're moving in the right direction. Um, just the simple fact that Director Grise gives us the right numbers and she can show us where she got them from makes mm -hmm. me feel so much better about numbers I'm approving. I mean, if you asked me a year and a half ago before our business director left, he was telling us that we had $2 million excess. We were doing great. He leaves, treasurer comes in, new treasurer comes in and says we're down $1.65 million. I mean, what a swing, right? Mm -hmm. But it's only as good as the numbers we get. So there's a lot of conversations about transparency and knowing what goes on. A lot of what will happen will be a result of your participation. You volunteer for different things that will be going on in town. Um, there are a lot of committees and, um, and events that occur that require people's help. Get involved. Look at the... Um, uh, look at the stuff on TV, anything that's on TV, the committee meetings, the select board meeting, uh, planning board meeting. All of those things are things that are public, and they put them out there for folks to be able to see and comment on. So when you get to the point, so what do we do and how we do this, uh, it's going to depend upon how the electorate feels and what expressions they want to be able to make. And so I would encourage everybody to get involved. I wouldn't say yell and scream, but get involved. I, just, I want to like piggyback on kind of what Dr. Riley said for on the town side. What this override, right, right now we're so lean, like we don't have backup. We don't have any a succession plan. We don't have, like, uh, there's two people in the treasurer collector's office and our, our workload is growing as the, as the number of houses grow. Um, what this override does is set us up for additional help so that we can make things run more efficiently because right now we're just getting by and um, I think the the budget with the override also the chiefs can speak to that like what what it's going to help their offices um, their departments run more efficiently um, so we have 
a, a succession plan and have backup for the people. If, if something happens to me right now, payroll doesn't get done. <laughs> so that kind of stuff. I know they don't like that, but <laughs> that's a big problem. But um, this, the override budget puts us back so that we can function properly, like the, like the comments that Dr. Riley said about the school district. It, it, it's putting things back where they should be so that we can move into the future. I mean, Chief can talk, or both Chiefs can talk That's about what they're getting. <laughs> That's lead in the Chief Mike, please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Question in the back. Oh. Uh, yeah. Uh, going back to student population, okay? How many did we graduate <laughs> from Wachusett in the town of Rutland last year, okay? Now, the numbers that we graduated, what happens to the money that we paid? Does that all go back to zero and then they start focusing on the new kids that are coming in? Is that where they get their numbers from? So, um, the uh, October, uh, our our graduates who were captured this year in October, that's the money we get um, next year. So trying to think what the, what the final count was. Um, so in October this year, our, our total count was 6,809 students. And so next year, we may have 6,900 students, but our, our, uh, our financial support will be based on 6,809. And so you're always almost a year behind in your funding. And so if those, when those students uh, move on, you're right, they were counted. But the money that they brought into the district or the state allowed us um, to get reimbursed for, that's actually for the previous year's uh, census of students. That makes sense. Okay, so I kind of gather what you're saying is that went with 1.65 and blah, 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 so on and so forth. So okay, so now we have we're, we're getting taxed based upon the number of new students entering the district this year plus what's already there. Uh, I'm not sure if I quite follow you. I'm sorry. Okay, whatever number the new students, 175, I guess, or something like that. Okay, now all right, and there's already students there, sophomore through uh, senior. Okay, so. Now, okay, we're paying a certain amount on sophomore through senior, and you're adding 175. Okay, all right. So this is where the, the tax increase, basically for Wachusett School District, is what you've been telling us, okay, based on 175. Now the number that graduated last year, okay, does that get equated into the 175, or is it just a, a total history? No, we will take a new census in, in October, and then Redlands Town Assessment will be based on that one for next year's budget. Right. And, okay. and, and <coughs> I think that's all determined by law as well. It's, 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 it's the funding formula by the state and how they set it up. Of course. So, Paul, it also goes, it, it's based on the, the K to 12. It's not just based on the right. high school. Right. So. Um, oh, I understand. Right, so we have those new, that new kindergarten class coming in well, that takes the place of that. I assume well, that was, it was 75. 75, whatever. 75, but yeah. I assume it's for all 12 grades. It is. Right. It is. And it's actually spread out pretty well through those 12 grades, too. Yeah, high school was 24 additional students of those 76. Okay. Or 78. All right. Thank you. Okay, please. Real, real, just real quick, and Bay Path is completely separate from that, right? Yes. That's a separate Why not? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. That's okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, Seth Knife, I serve as your fire chief. Um, we don't have time for you now. Thanks for coming. Just give you kind of a uh, brief overview of the fire service here in town. Uh, the fire service that we provide to you is an all hazard service. The days of just fighting fires and doing medical calls, that's, we've gone way beyond that. Um, as I said, all services, what that means is we do hazardous materials, um, identification and mitigation. We do, you know, uh, advanced auto extrication of the new vehicles now. Uh, we do confined space rescue when people are trapped in a manhole or uh, anything like that. Uh, we are part of a regional uh, dive and recovery team. Uh, so our staff are very highly trained uh, individuals. Uh, currently, we staff 
um, right now four full-time staff during the day in th from 7 in the morning to 7 at night and three on the overnight from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. seven days a week that has been in place since 2020 um, we went to full-time 24-hour uh, staffing back in 2013 and that was done through an override uh, back in 2013 to increase our staffing to get a 24-hour um, uh, round-the-clock coverage uh, we received a federal grant in 2020 to hire three additional staffing in order to get us to this level. And the reason why we are at this level is uh, during the daytime hours, all of our part-time on-call staff are all working their full-time jobs and they don't work in town. So we need the resources during the day to be able to answer the calls. We staff two advanced life support ambulances 24 <coughs> hours a day. And during the day, both those ambulances can be gone simultaneously um, to the city and back uh, multiple times during the day. Since we've been here for an hour, my phone's been going off, we've had three medical calls in the last hour. Um, so we are a very, very busy service. Uh, what we would potentially be losing with this override failing is a reduction in work hours. And it equates to 1.8 full-time equivalent people or 72 hours a week of staff hours not being covered. Um, with some negotiation with the union, we've been able to rearrange their schedules that for one point there was a chance of completely losing um, all Saturday coverage. So by rearranging some of the full-time schedules, we're able to cover all seven days. But what that's going to do, it's going to leave Saturday, Sunday, and Wednesday with only two people on at night and only three people on during the day. So what potentially could happen is a delayed in response because we would have to wait for people from home to respond back to the station in order to man a fire truck or man the second ambulance. That being said, uh, that's where our biggest staff reduction uh, comes. The next piece on the um, uh, on the expense side of the house, uh, we'd be looking at cutting um, non how do you say uh, expenses that are not fixed and what i mean by fixed cost there's certain things that whether we do one call or a thousand calls there's certain expenses we have to pay every year and since march of 2018 when uh, the governor signed in that we now state municipalities are now fall under ocean reg osha regulations and because we now are under the um, public sector employees now fall under osha there's certain guidelines that we must follow so certain testing of equipment um, that has to get done every year. So that's kind of, we classify that as a fixed cost. And where we have to cut now is really in maintenance. So we have a budget to maintain our fire apparatus. And we tried to get oil changes done. Anything that breaks during the year, we, we, we get out ahead of it, get it fixed, and repaired, get the truck back in service. What this is doing is it's cutting um, our ability to be able to rapidly repair equipment. <coughs> Um, so there could be a chance that something catastrophic breaks. We may not be able to fix it immediately. It may have to wait to a special town meeting two or three months later to get some funds to be able to fix it. Uh, we don't want to see that, but that's, that's how tight our budget is. Um, we've cut out um, fire protective uh, gear, the turnout gear that the firefighters wear. I'll give you an example. Uh, five, six years ago, we used to have built into our line item budget to buy seven sets of turnout gear for firefighters. And each year after that, it's gone from seven to five to three and now to, the, now to none. And the reason why it's gone less is the money was level funded, but the cost of the inflation of buying that piece of equipment um, <coughs> is now gone to the point it's almost $4,000 per set of gear to equip a firefighter, and it's only good for seven years. So we have to be on a replacement program to be able to maintain that. Um, and another thing that the fire service provides to you that you may not see that your tax dollars are going towards is everyone here that has, pays homeowner's insurance. If you, if you own a piece of property, you have a home, you're paying your homeowner's insurance. <coughs> well, what we provide to you um, as far as the level of service results directly in what you pay for homeowner's insurance. So the better fire protection you have, the lower your homeowner's insurance rate is. 
Um, two years ago, we were reclassified uh, by the insurance services offices as an ISO class four, which is a very good rate for a community of our size. Uh, we cover 35 square miles, um, and only the center town population is covered by pressurized hydrant system. Everything outside of that, mm -hmm. we have to carry water to you or find alternative water sources. We've proven to them that we can provide so many gallons per minute for a two hour length of time to be able to fight fires outside the hydrant district. So by going from a class five, which we were, to a class four, your homeless insurance went down 8%. You may not have seen it because it gets, sometimes it gets tied up and your mortgage company pays that. You don't really see that bill. Um, but that's part of your, es your uh, escrow account that's in your mortgage that gets paid by the bank that you may not see the increase or the decrease each year. So again, by the level of service that we provide, comes back to you in some type of relief on your homeless insurance. With staffing cuts and cuts to equipment and services, this potential in the next two years we get re-audited again, we may lose that rate and your insurance may go up. Um, so that's pretty much where we are. Um, as you know, we provide ambulance service to the community. Last year, our budget was $1.2 million for fire and ambulance. We brought in $640,000 in revenue that went to the general fund that offset, but you don't really see it, but it, it went to the general fund to offset our operations. So almost 50% of the total cost for fire and ambulance service is refunded back to the town in service fees that we collect from the insurance company. So just give you an idea. Thank you, Chief. Just before, if there's any questions, of Luke, and I want to, I want to let everybody know. <coughs> thank the two chiefs. Certainly, thank Rebecca. Pretty much every department head has been here. I see Dave George sitting here. Nancy Nichols in the back. But I want everybody to know that these folks are going to do the best they can for you, the residents, with what they've got, and then some. So I, I want you all to know that you've got a hell of a team of department heads here and departments that are running as best they can. So we appreciate your input. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know that. So, is there a question I missed? It? Do you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Um, so, the library has a donation fund, the police department. Does the fire department have a Friends of Fire? Let's change that name. But anyway, <laughs> and that, that would complicate things. But anyway, do you have? a place where people can donate to where it's your discretionary fund yes you know i i go to a church and i donate and it goes to the pastor's discretionary fund hopefully things are going well but <laughs> you know i think each department that citizens in this town feel exceptionally fond of <coughs> need to have that so that we're not sitting in a room like this seven years from now wondering seriously what the heck. Yes, we do. We do have a five-power gift account. Okay. Um, that will, uh, we accept donations um, normally f through families and um, that will, will give money to us f to better provide services to the community and whether it's, you know, CPR classes for the community to, you know, better prepare people. Um, we've We've actually utilized that money to use to match grants that, you know, our 50-50 matching grant, we've used that to be able to obtain a piece of equipment to better our services. Um, so we've been able to utilize that in the past and been very appreciative of it. Good. And who is our town communicator? <coughs> Who's our person that gets all this lovely information that we've gotten today and that we need to get out and, and make it concise? There's a huge population that don't have the Internet don't know how to operate even a flip phone. And they're interested in this information. I know. <laughs> so how do we get this information to them so that they can digest it? You know, the senior center is phenomenal, but not everybody goes there either. How do we do that? Yeah, thank you, uh, and you're right. Um, even though I've, you can probably tell by looking at me, I grew up with social media and technology, <laughs> right? Um, I can't hide it. Um, so, but that that's certainly one venue and, and, and one, uh, I think, avenue that I'd like to 
build upon is our digital communication strategy. So our website and all of our social media uh, accounts that we either have or, or will have. So that's certainly one thing and, and a tool that I think we can improve on uh, and put all of this information that, uh, that we've already talked about or, or that we will be talking about. Uh, but you're right, certainly I think um, there's communication venues that we're not using or that maybe that we don't know about. Um, so for example, um, I'm a big fan of, of monthly newsletters. Um, in, a, in a previous, com well, I keep saying this previous community, I just came from the town of Acton where I worked in the town manager's office and I did a lot of budget, finance, and communications. Um, so I did develop a monthly newsletter and Becky had, had mentioned um, the tax bill insert. So what we did is for every tax bill, we had a two page newsletter that was included and sent to every tax bill with every, with every tax bill. So we can talk about some of the programs that are going on or we can talk about the budget process. So, and that was included in the cost of sending out the tax bill. So that's something that we can do. And that's hitting a lot more people than perhaps the senior center or perhaps folks that can't attend these Sunday sessions. So, so that's one thing certainly. Um, I think engaging with our uh, community um, organizations, so whether it's the Lions Club or the Little League or the PTOs, Involving and in, in sharing information across all of those avenues is one thing that I'd like to, to continue, continue to do. Um, we certainly have a lot of opportunities to improve communications, and that's one thing that I think, again, I need as the administrator and, and working on behalf of the select board and town departments. Town departments also do a lot of good work, and they have a lot of events and social media accounts <coughs> that they use. I think we can do a lot of cross-sharing. Um, that's certainly something that is going to be a focus of, of me as I, as I assume this role fully uh, and build that out um, over the next few years and months um, to make sure that everyone is informed. But certainly I think informing people about um, select board meetings and finance committee meetings, uh, the fact that you all are here, you, you should see the select board meeting. It's usually Paul um, and maybe a couple other people that attend. Uh, if you know about things, I think um, that's a better opportunity to receive that feedback um, and keep everyone informed about uh, what the board is up to, the school committee, um, and every town department about some of the services that are provided. So, okay. but, but I'm going to ask you a question, and, <coughs> and for the rest of the group. I certainly have ideas, but I think I can only, uh, I can keep everyone informed if I know about things. So do you have any other ideas? or places that I should be as, as the new administrator to, to get the word out? For you personally, I'm not rightly sure. Seems like you got a lot on your plate. Um, but I'm thinking the town of Paxton has a senior center um, newsletter. And I think ours, yeah, yeah, right right here. Here. and I, I think we do too. Um, and it goes to not only the senior center, but it goes to senior housing in different locations, maybe put it over at Rutland Market, make sure that we've got it prominently placed here in the library. It is. And, and I have yet to stumble across one. In the post office. Post office, yeah. And I mean, I'm everywhere, unfortunately, or, you know, depending on. Um, and I think if we could update on, okay, select board meeting is on this day. Or, you know, that sort of thing in that publication might go a long way. Because a lot of people will say, dang, I forgot, or I didn't know, or, you know, whatever. Or you go and tell me about it later. <coughs> and by then, perhaps votes or, you know, that sort of thing is passed. And, um, so I don't know. And the DPW. I don't know how everybody feels about it, but I love the over-communicating he's doing. <laughs> you know, I really do. I, I like knowing this is how much money we have, this is why we can't do everything, and I like that level of communication, and it's only on Facebook that I've found. Hmm. If we could have a representation like that, that might be more useful, you know? Absolutely. So. That's just my two cents. So, very close to my heart is the senior center. Mm -hmm. Not that I go there. <laughs> uh -huh. But they have a representative from 
Senator Gobi's office saying and so forth, why don't you come here once a month and bring someone with you and at least once a month and talk about yeah. what's happening. And that way it won't come as a surprise five <coughs> weeks and three days before town meeting. Yep. That. This is assuming the library is still open. <laughs> exactly, okay. but I mean, what, something's yes, got to about having our like monthly, monthly mm -hmm. like meetings like this. Right. I mean, this is definitely something. If we always know it's the same Sunday every month mm -hmm. that there's an event, then people will know that. Yeah, yeah come. I'd be happy to. I think that's great. Also, um, my intent is to, um, you can tell I love being in front of cameras. That's a joke. <laughs> but we have a great public access. Right. Um, yeah. television um, operation, right? And I know there was previous administrators that did use that technology and had an opportunity to get the word out. So whether it's attending in person, I'll be happy to do that. This is a beautiful library. We have beautiful buildings. I'd be happy to attend if whatever. the library's open because that's yeah. where the station is. It's yeah. over there. Yeah, absolutely. But I think in terms of um, whether it's weekly, bi-weekly, monthly updates on our public access television and bringing the chiefs or bringing other department heads, bringing Dr. Riley or school committee members to let the let the community about community know about things that are going on. I think communications you have to be intentional, and and repetitive. Just keep getting the information out there. Because to your point about well, we did put that in the newsletter. I don't know if you saw that, but just consistently putting out the information. Um, so not just once, because obviously that's not enough. We're busy, right? We're oh, human. I get it. I no, I'm talking about just the, yeah. the members of the community, right? Um, so we can't expect you to see everything when it comes out. But if we're consistent in our communication strategy, uh, I think we can we can uh, get the information to you a lot better. So and there's also there's meetings, meeting minutes, right? All the meeting minutes are submitted. Posted. They're all posted on the town website too. So if you miss a meeting, you can go and go back and read the the minutes from that meeting. Okay. So if not. Never mind, I was going to be a little argumentative. <laughs> mm -hmm. But remember, not everybody has websites, not everybody is computer. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. The library can help. So and if the library it. closes, yeah, then, then we're then, screwed. Then they don't have the access. Yeah. Well, all I'm saying is I think it's great that you, you come out. I think during the day, I think elders don't want to drive out at night to a 7 o'clock meeting at night time. It's dark. They go home at night. They're scared. It's dark again. <laughs> I, I just think during the day is smart. I mean, these meetings have been well attended. Sunday afternoons, no doubt about it. I think there's something here. I think you're right. Yeah? Sure. Thank you. Um, Beth Hussey, Checking the Road. I just have a comment related back to the override. Um, I feel like there's no realistic alternative. So I support it, but when it's presented to the town at the town meeting, uh, like rather than like, well, this is going to be good for three to five years. Um, like people don't want to just go through this every three to five years. Like I feel like the town needs to express we are going to do something differently we're going to find a way to bring in other forms of revenue. We are going to do it. Because this has gone on for like 30 years or more. Um, and as a related um, aspect of it, where I live, there's a lot of new houses. I consider some of them to be in a swamp because everything just gets rubber stamped, approved. It, it, that's what it feels like. And then I heard that actually there's not enough electrical infrastructure to support the number of houses there. Um, and so that just made me think when we're approaching this building, all the building, <coughs> is it possible to like say, do we have the infrastructure to support these houses? And if we don't, then we have to pause. Because um, I, I do, can we afford to send this 1.5 kids to the school? Can we afford to plow this new road? Um, so. Yeah. So um, 
One thing I want to highlight, I think there was, sounds like there was two questions or comments there that, I, that I'd like to respond to. So um, I, I think I, I view this override as, as an opportunity to demonstrate to the community the investment that this override will be in the town services and, and protecting the core services that, again, you all expect and deserve. Uh, I've taken a lot of time over the past two, week, two weeks to, to meet a lot of town staff and, and get to know the services that they provide. The buildings that they're they're housed in, uh, the equipment, the operations that they uh, that they're dealing with. Um, both of our public safety chiefs, I think, do a great job, and they're just one example. All town departments, but I'm going to highlight the two chiefs, uh, particularly on <coughs> on the leadership that they provide in terms of um, obtaining outside uh, funding sources like grants. For just for example, if you walk through the fire department, a lot of that apparatus has been paid for mm. by outside funding sources, grants. Yep. So that is saving the town money in terms of investment on obtaining new equipment to, to make sure that they have uh, the most up-to-date equipment to be able to provide the best service that, that, uh, that you need um, to, for those services. So um, this allows, the override allows us <coughs> to have the staff capacity to continue pursuing those outside funding sources, uh, funding sources so we can leverage um, a lot of the money that's out there, especially over the past few years, there's a lot of state and federal money that we should be taking advantage of to upgrade our infrastructure, to obtain new equipment, to hire new firefighters or police officers, um, or investing in our town buildings that I'm sure if you walk <coughs> through any town building, you see that a lot of our buildings need some work. And we can take, and we can take advantage of that, and we should. So, um, so the override will allow us to restore those those positions so we can continue uh, looking for that for that funding. And then to your point about the um, the growth, if you will, um, I think that was an intent of, of the bylaw that was passed and, and if someone could help me out, the growth management bylaw. Uh, the original intent, I think, was to look at that um, and see if that was an opportunity to, well, I guess, to manage growth, if you will. Um, but it's certainly not, it wasn't ideal, it certainly didn't uh, prevent any of the growth that is that has been permitted and authorized years ago. Actually, a lot of that growth was exempted in the bylaw. But there are certainly, I think, tools and, and ways that we can look and, and, and project how this growth is going to affect us. And, and then we can, again, through this open budget process, um, demonstrate to the community, look, we do have this development that is coming over in, in the next few years. Um, this is what it's going to cost. So again, it's just being open and transparent about everything that's happening on, on town government side um, and, and, and showing you why we need the resources that we're asking for. Um, there's a lot of planning and zoning tools out there that we can take advantage of that I don't know if we've explored, but certainly we, we can. Um, you do have an elected planning board. That's an opportunity to relay some of the comments that you mentioned uh, to that elected independently elected body as well. Um, but on, on the town side, uh, our town planner and community development coordinator, uh, Mr. George, does a, does a lot of work, and I look forward to working with him on, on taking advantage of um, some planning and, and zoning economic development opportunities. Um, I've spent a lot of time growing up coming through Rutland, and, and it's been amazing to see the transition. I see so much opportunity in this community for economic development um, to be able to hopefully uh, relieve some of the, the residential tax that's what, tax base. That's what people need to hear. What yeah. They said. Mm -hmm. So and and there's certainly a lot of um, opportunities there that I look forward to pursuing with uh, town departments and, and particularly Mr. George on that one. So with that, Austin, is it okay if um, David gets up and shares a couple of things? Sure. Perhaps maybe the heights and the additional revenue that'll be coming in in the next couple of three years, or the managed growth, or whatever you can share with the folks. Sure, great. Would you mind if I do it from here? You want me to? That's fine. Yeah, great, thank you. So um, the planning office may not be necessarily as visible as fire and police or the library or the senior center, but a lot of work does come out of the planning office to support the town's operations. Um, I've been here for four years prior to me coming on board. It was not a full-time planner. It was done by a contractual basis. Um, the planning office touches on a lot of different aspects of town government. Um, including basic land use functions, getting matters before the planning board for various types of petitions. Some of these are lot splits, site plans, special permits, and so forth. Um, 
Other things involve working with the RDIC, the Rutland Development Industrial uh, Commission, on the disposition of the land at the former state hospital. Uh, the department also works with the HBDD board, the Heights Plan Development District Review Board, which has the authority to look at a site plan and grant a permit for development, such as what we now have at the site, which is age-restricted, 142 units. Uh, I'll get to that in, in a moment in terms of, of that, of how good that is uh, in terms of revenue. Uh, the town, the department also works with the zoning board of appeals on large commercial projects, the agricultural commission on smaller projects, and the planning board bylaw subcommittee, the economic development commission, and the master plan steering committee. So it's a very busy department. There's a lot of activity, and we're pretty much on pace now for the prior <coughs> years in terms of what the planning board is, is dealing with. But just to touch on a couple of things that the office does do, which hopefully contributes positively to the town's revenue, is working with the RDIC and the town administrator's office and other departments. The Heights property had sat vacant for many years. Mike Sullivan taking the charge as the chair, uh, working with the TA's office and planning and so forth. We were able to dispose of 38 acres of that total land development area for a age-restricted 142-unit housing development project. Under the current tax rate and looking at a full build-out, we're talking recurring revenues of three-quarters of a million dollars per year. Uh, under phase one, which is 44 units, we're looking at recurring revenue of $230,000 per year. We're also looking at permit fees of over $100,000 per year and other fees related to this. So without that land being disposed of, with the planning office helping, doing its part, working with others to do its part, we now have a revenue opportunity. In addition to that number of units, the applicant will also be extending the water line from the school to the site. That's going to open up development potential on the remaining land, which can be disposed of sold. That means sold. That means town owns it, town sells it. Uh, through the RFP process, which will generate additional revenues to the town. In addition to the revenue, the actual land sale was $1.65 million. So, planning office is trying to help. Um, Economic Development Commission was recently appointed a year ago. The planning office is helping that department get its feet under it to look for opportunities to engage with new business owners who may want to come into town to work on economic development and growth strategies. <coughs> And things like that to help generate revenue in town on the commercial side in particular. We do realize that the commercial side is too low, residential side is too high. We're trying to do our small part to increase the commercial tax base, which would have a positive effect overall. Uh, lastly, just to highlight, two things to highlight. So the master plan steering committee, we're working on the master plan update. The update was last done more than 20 years ago. Um, I would say the money's there came from grants. Nothing is coming out of the general fund for this. So it's, it's grant funds working with the Regional Planning Commission. The, the importance of that master plan is the implementation part. So there are several chapters, many of which they touch all, all aspects of government, including economic development, land use, public services, and so forth. So we're looking forward to, in particular, economic development strategies from the master plan, which can help increase the commercial tax base. We do have several excellent recommendations at this point. <coughs> and lastly, just to touch on, we have the interdepartmental review. The purpose of this is to work with departments like fire police and others on projects that are coming in to look at these projects early to try to help the applicant come up with the best project possible. So those are some of the big projects that the office works on. Now, Talking about the future of, of the office and how it can help, if there's no planning office, you don't have any of those things. Just to be frank about it. So I think this bank for the buck do try to help. Um, the IRT, I just want to touch about briefly. The IRT includes the police and fire departments. These departments are at the table looking at projects early to try to help in terms of identifying red flags. Without an override passing, you're not going to have these, these gentlemen at the table. So you may not get a quality project or quality product. And maybe just lastly to conclude, I know a lot of folks have um, land that you own if you're a longtime resident, which may be you know, <coughs> part, of, uh, part of financial strategies. The planning office helps you to turn that illiquid asset into an asset, which is part of your plan. So we do try to work with you on that, but <coughs> without looking towards a future planning office, which is not sufficiently funded. 
uh, getting those projects through is going to take more time than it needs to. It may not even get done on a timely basis. So, you know, those are some of the bigger, some of the bigger purposes of the project, of the department, some of the bigger projects that it touches on, and some of the revenue impacts that I think, you know, pe people ought to hear about. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Yes, sir. Other than the hospital project, what now do we have, David, that is up and coming? What are we working on and what are we doing to solicit <coughs> businesses and enterprise to come to Rutland right now? Right, so I heard a couple of couple of points there. So there is project, there are projects that have been permitted already, which we're waiting for those projects to come online, such as Century Oil. Century Oil has a part of its land that it wants to use and develop as a car wash. We're still waiting for that to occur, but they have their permits. So once that gets built, now you'll see that uh, being brought into the assessed uh, tax base. Um, I believe your site is a good example of one, the self storage facility on uh, 68. You have a couple of extra parcels nearby that haven't been developed. So if you want to talk about how to develop those, I think that's part of the mix as well. I guess what I'm what I'm getting at is is what do we have on the docket and what are we doing to market ourselves as a business friendly community to increase those revenues? Right. So what that are we was, doing? What exactly are we doing? Sure. Just to finish the thought, if you don't mind, in terms of what's on the docket. So you have your land next door, which we can talk about if you have any plans for the development of that. Uh, there is the Dunkin' Donuts across the way here. The house that was next door has been taken down. There's redevelopment plans that we expect to be happening sh uh, soon to alter that site to provide for a more better access around it. That is going to be happening. We're still waiting for those plans. In terms of your actual, what are we doing to engage the public? Those are strategies that we're working on through the master plan and through the Economic Development Commission and through a strategy that we're going to work with the town administrator's office on in terms of a digital and connectivity strategy. So a lot of this is in the works. You know, trying to develop planning capacity takes some time, and we've been working at it diligently over a period of time, and those are some of the strategies that we will be looking on, and those are some of the recommendations we're currently gathering. Okay. And then as it relates, I think it's great that you have projections on, you know, what's going to happen at the hospital, what's going on. Don't quote me on exact numbers, but there is a number, 300, 400, 500 approved building lots, something along those lines in Rutland right now. I'm, ask, I'm asking the question. I, I don't know. Yes, there are there are, right? there are subdivisions that are existing. Right. So correct. my question would be, what are we doing as a planning <coughs> office to look at those and project those to your point on what is this going to mean? in the next five years, what's going to mean in the next 15 years? Because we're going to be living with that. Yeah, there's a moratorium, but really it hasn't had any impact for the last, since it's been passed, because we have all these approved sites, right? So what is that impact? Right, so a lot of these are subdivisions which <coughs> are not subject to the rate development limitation bylaw because they're exempt. Um, I would also say we are working on growth models to help understand the impacts of those growths. We're working with the superintendent's office. We provided information to get into the mix for your growth strategy. So you'll have access to the master plan. You have some of that already. So we, we, I think we want to take more of a data-driven approach to understand the implementation of the development once it's built out. Right now it's unrealized, but it will be realized at some point. But I think we're looking at financial models data to try to assess the impacts of these developments and to try to have some way to account for the cost. But those are things that are in development, but that's a great question. Thank you for asking it. I mean, we have, uh, we have a, a group of developers in Rutland. I mean, can we sit down with them and try and understand what their plans are for the approved properties that they have to try and project what that's going to be? I mean, I've been in town for 29 years. I've seen this town grow, right? And it's all grown on the residential side. It hasn't grown on the other side. Um, I mean, looking at the budget that we have and the issues that we have right now, I mean, we're, we're putting a Band-Aid on this right now. I mean, next year, we're gonna be in the same, same spot. And 
we're not really doing what we need to plan and project that out. Because I think if we actually looked at it, we're in trouble. I would just comment to say that Austin really did talk about more forward-looking um, financial plans. Mm -hmm. They all have impacts. I, I mean, a comment that was in a movie at one point at time that said, if, if you build it, they will come. That's what's happening here. This is a very, very attractive um, socioeconomic area. But it's all weighted to residential. I mean, right. And so people, they want to come out here. That's what happens. You put these these projects that come uh, come to fruition. They're gonna you're gonna see them come out there. What's the impact going to be? Well, it's not going to cut back on anything. Things are going to be a little bit more costly. I'm, I'm sorry. Over here first. Can I just add? Uh, sure. I think to your, to your question about what are we doing, I think there's been a lot of good work that's been already done. I mean, the fact that you've established an economic development committee. That's a good first step. That's telling the business community that you're serious about economic development and you want to work collaboratively with the community to identify what the needs are. We have members of the committee. Uh, Dave is helping, you know, as he mentioned, get that, uh, that committee up and running. But that committee uh, will be able to guide the town strategy for what we need for economic development. Looking at some of these parcels, uh, we, just, uh, we just reached out to our state delegation through their budget process to ask for funding to be able to, to uh, for site readiness and marketing for the Rutland Heights property saying this is the work that's already been done. This is, uh, these are some of the opportunities down at the Heights property. So uh, the fact that you're funding a community development office is also a positive thing for a community of this size, showing that we're serious about economic and, and community development. So there's a lot of other things that we can be doing, certainly. But I think we're already, uh, I think we have some good progress already for just the two things that I've mentioned. Um, and then working with some of the other stakeholders that they will be able to assist us to be able to further those efforts. <coughs> so, yeah, I have a lot to say. I've been biting my tongue this whole time. Um, so just bear with me for a moment. Um, I apologize to you for the comment about your two parcels of land because that was uncalled for. He might have two parcels of land. It's his decision what to do with it. This town has been so grossly just mismanaged as far as growth, and that's why we're in this problem. As far as these subdivisions that we don't know what the outcome is going to be, the outcome is going to be more students that are going to be bombarding our school district. There's going to be more of a um, demand on police, on fire. They're going to be understaffed again. That's what the effect of these subdivisions is going to be. As far as police and fire, those budgets should not be touched. Those are the two departments that every single person in town uses, whether it's you're not calling the, but I call for Pleasantdale Road in 122 on like a monthly basis. So your dispatchers do great because I'm the one calling all the time about the accidents there. That's ridiculous. Those budgets should not be touched. As far as the school district, there's nothing you can do about that. I'm a teacher. I understand. I am in negotiate on the negotiation team in my district. I get what that is all about. As far as what you can do to hold people accountable, you have school committee members. They have to approve the budget. They're supposed to be in charge of that budget and what's, what it's going to. There's all sorts of things. As far as abatements, yes, there are abatements. There's opportunities for senior citizens. Is that percentage or is that money going to go up by 20%? <coughs> because if somebody's already getting that and they're barely making it, is that money now going to increase for them to offset the two and a half percent? Mass general law. Well, but see, that's not. I mean, you're looking at people that have been in town for forty-five years. Forty-five years, and they can't afford their taxes. I I can't change. I'm, I, I'm not I know, saying I'm like, that, <laughs> but I, I mean, like, just constantly just say, say, well, there's there's opportunities. Right. Go back to the assessment, the assessor's office. There, there's not. If somebody's already getting that financial funding, there is nothing else they can do. And what all of you have been saying is, we can't pull for money that you don't have. You can borrow, wait, please let me have my moment. No, go ahead. <laughs> you can take money out of an, out of an account, right? But it, the, that bill is still gonna be there. Same thing for these seniors that have been here for 45 years. Right. They can borrow that money, they can take it out of next 
next month's paycheck. They can move it on. That money is not there. So unless we actually give credit to the people that have been in this town and have built this town yes. for 45 years, mm -hmm. then I'm sorry. Like, I, I, I'm just right. flabbergasted. Right in now. terms of that, I mean, that we're, we're governed by Mass General Law. So I, I know, that. I know, and I'm like, I would take it out of my own pocket and hand it to people, and I do do payment plans with people from the tax office. But it's if the money is not, yeah. I know. So that, then I go to the Council on Aging, or maybe some of these other gift funds that, that we could set up for those seniors, and we need to do a better job of, of working with them to to get that, get some sort of system out there. But in terms of abatements and exemptions, I'm governed by Mass General Law. Right. So I there's, can't just, and I can't change the way that we tax people. I can't, I mean, I'm, that's, I'm not going to break the law to do things differently. You know, I, I have I'm to not do that. suggesting right. that. I'm saying that yeah. we need to actually take and have some respect for some of the seniors that have been in this town for a very, very long time that really are not having a say at the table at the moment. As far as the um, older 50, I'm sorry, mother, um, over 50 community that's going into Brooklyn Heights, those are not affordable. For the people that are on Social Security, what happened to affordable housing? For the residents that maybe they can't afford their taxes on their large property anymore, but they still want to stay in town. Have we considered affordable senior housing for some of these plots? I mean, I, I just, I've lived on and off in Rutland for my 40 something years. And where we are right now, is just heartbreaking to me. And I don't want to say. I went through Wachusett schools. They were wonderful. I'm not saying take away from the school budget. Those kids de deserve an education that I got. I'm not saying take away from police and fire because those should not be touched. And to even consider touching those departments is ridiculous. We need them. So one of the things that Austin had made a point before is that he talked to state representatives. That's where the change occurs here. It, it's important. I think your, your passion here is very well noted. And I think we need to take that passion and direct it to the people who have the most opportunity to make changes. It's well, then what am I supposed to say to them? Say to the people who can't afford it. No, what am I supposed to say to the, to the um, government representatives? Oh, well, I think it's pretty simple. You, you have to find, you can't just go ahead and dictate. Things have to happen without finding a way to be able to fund that stuff. I think that's a that's the direct question that you ask to these to these folks. You're giving us mandates to be able to go ahead and do things, and you're not giving us any funding to be able to sort it. And we know, quite honestly, that the state has a ton of money sitting in its po pockets down in Boston. So I think that the 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 emphasis needs to be, hey, you've got to do something to be able to help the people that are in the state, never mind just the town, but in the state for a long period of time. Um, I, you have to you have to rattle a cage. You do have to rattle a cage. I mean, I rattle a lot. Not everything needs to go down me. and sit on a street down there, but you have to have to rattle a cage. I rattle a lot. Sorry, Tom. I later. don't <laughs> shut up. <laughs> She's got a plan. <laughs> I like to you. The one thing you can certainly do is advocate for a change in the state funding formula for the schools. I did. I, I work in Worcester. I, I've done my share as part of that union. We've gotten quite a bit of funding, so I appreciate that. But well, um, I don't. I don't really mean that though. I mean the regional school side of things. I mean, if they were to change funding formula to give more money to the town and not make it 51 percent of our budget, it would do great things. It would be able to fund so much more <coughs> to our town if we can reduce our our regional need, you know, our regional assessment. So, not only does it have to come from school committee, which we write resolutions and ask them to help, and you know we hope that the town is writing to them asking for help in the state funding formula. But if the people of the town say, "My seniors can't pay their taxes, we need help with our schools," it, everything helps. Yeah. You know? And on that, and on the town side too. So the state last year had, I think it was record revenue, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. record revenue. Yeah. And this year, and I know the schools obviously, uh, I think <coughs> the state could do a lot better job to fund all of local government operations on education town mm -hmm. side. Just to give you reference, uh, for the fiscal year 24 budget, uh, through our cherished revenues, which is state aid, mm -hmm. we're projecting 1.6 percent increase in state aid. Mm -hmm. 
1.6, and they had just had record revenues. So the fact is, state uh, the local aid that is coming from the state is not matching the state's revenue mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. um, there's also inequity. If you think about um, cannabis revenues, uh, there, I think there's a couple. I wish he was here to be able to tell me how many we have coming to town. But um, the state there's collects. At least one that I, saw. I don't know why. I so if you up. go to if you go to a cannabis what are they called? Dispensary. 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 Tell don't go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, there's a 20% tax that's added to your purchase. 17 of that goes to the state for their revenue. The town gets three. But a lot of the work is done at the local level. Mm -hmm. That's an inequity. So I, I could go on and on about the inequities between you know, state revenues and our local revenues. Um, some of the mass general law requirements that we have to comply with that uh, restrict our ability to be able to assist, assist folks. Um, so, so if you want to talk about what you can do to talk to um, your state and federal delegation, those are just, just a couple. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, that may be a good opportunity for us to collaboratively host a, a forum about some of the challenges that we're having, um, either on the education side or on the town side. Um, and maybe we can advocate and work with them to see if they can advocate for us at the, uh, at the state level. Mm -hmm. <coughs> How are we doing with uh, questions? I just have one more. <laughs> Sorry. Um, when we were going over the COVID or I, you corrected me and started with an A. Okay, that one. Um, and you said people are going over to see how the money's dispersed. Is there a transparent way where we can say the town was given X amount of dollars, and this penny went there, and that penny went there. Because I think that is a great interest to the mo to the people I know. Yeah. It's actually the board selectman votes on every every disper any every allocation. We do have a spreadsheet that I that I could provide put on the website for people to see. Okay, that would be great. Yeah. And then does it fluctuate? Does it change? Is there like, you know, Bob needed X amount of whatever? So we've taken it from Ted to give it to Bob, and you know, does it? Not at is it fluid? Point. No, not not at this point. We've we've got projects that we that the board of selectmen has voted on to fund. Some of them are underway. Some of them are not. We haven't spent any funds on. So we've we've got to have it all allocated by December two thousand twenty five. December of okay. 20, I, I think there's so. probably great interest in to know where that might, mm -hmm. how much was given to us in the first place mm -hmm. and where it's gone. Mm -hmm. And the last little bit was, I heard there's an industrial park going in at the end of Palma Gusset where 68, you know, in that area. It was discussed last Sunday. Is there any sort of something there? I live on Campbell Street. Mm -hmm. Every day I come out. Every day across the street, <laughs> lovely little log cabin, and that property. I was Clear. originally told, right? I was originally told the lady, the widow that lived there, was going to do a solar farm, and I thought, well, you know, that's not the worst. I wouldn't want that view living in that lovely log cabin, but you know, sure. Now, uh, mm -hmm. through the grapevine, I've heard that's going to be an industrial park. I, I, I don't know. Can I they probably could answer that, but yeah. I, I can't answer that. So if, if I don't know his email address, but you know, if somebody could give that to me, I'll ask him to come on website. Could, yeah, yeah. You could mm -hmm. ask through the administrator here. He'd be able to get you in touch. Oh, could you do that for me? Absolutely. Awesome. <laughs> I knew you awesome. would. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions? Any other concerns? I just go one quick question. It's just uh, not suggestive or anything, but you mentioned the emergency fund earlier. What would that be used for? What would be an example? And have we ever pulled from that before? Oh, a stabilization fund. Stabilization yeah. fund is it's a it's a um, accumulator um, from town meeting. Town meeting will decide to put a certain amount of money in there uh, every year. And it's intended to be able to build up as a reserve in case we run into a situation where there's no place, a one-time situation where we have no place else to go to get something uh, corrected, resolved, fixed. And we can go and we get it. We don't have to um, go through the whole process of, uh, of appropriate 
And what would that be? We would have. I town we would, it like, would have to be me. Okay. I, I, so Consider it's like a prudent so reserve, right? Exactly. It's yeah. like our savings account. So if, if our water source, if we lost our water source, or we had some some major fault in our in, uh, I don't know, a natural disaster or something like that, and we had to buy a fire truck or <coughs> you do something say like the, that, say the town line. meeting and say we need to take five hundred thousand dollars from our stabilization fund in order to repair this ca cat catastrophic or yeah, fix this catastrophic yeah. thing. Right. And and we would need two thirds vote from the town meeting right. to move that money out of there to to you know, it's in case of a catastrophic emergency is what we really should use it for. Okay. You know, um, it's you know, you can take it for little things and that type of stuff, but it it's not advisable. And the, our financial policies have us it the goal is to put uh, five percent of our certified free cash into. So we are continually putting into right. it. Yes, right. yes. And if you go to our special town meeting, you'll see the, like the first couple of votes are five percent of free cash into stabilization, five percent of free cash into capital stabilization, which are, again is for equipment, and um, five percent into OPEP, OPEP, OPEP yeah. which is our other. Uh, it's other employment benefits for, so for people that are going to retire you have to have a certain amount of money kind of set set aside for that right. eventual retirement so and, and it's important that that fund be managed and maintained because it has a direct effect on our uh, lending bond capability rating, yeah. bond ratings so as much as you as much as it may be sitting out there and people are salivating at the opportunity to be able to go get it it does take a, a two-thirds majority vote at the town meeting to, to affect that. Um, and you don't want to take it just because you can take it. You want to be able to make sure that you preserve it for the, the real thing that occurs. Any other questions or comments? I don't want to take up extra time. I just wanted to let folks know we have a page on the back about the library. If you want to know what's going to be lost, that page says it all. So I don't need to regurgitate it. Great, thank okay. you. The uh, the town meeting is May sixth. <laughs> that's that, that, that's we have to vote vote on the budget at that, and then there's election May eighth, where the the override question will be on the ballot. Both of those items need to be passed in order to pass the override. Right. So, if there's no other questions, I do really appreciate everybody's time uh, committing to Sunday afternoon. It's very great that you came out. Um, and with that, I'll just call an adjournment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.